People keep saying that thorium won't take off until it becomes price competitive with, yeah. with uranium. And I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right. And I think an analogy that you could use is that we didn't move from horses to cars because cars were cheaper than horses. We did it because cars do something different. They become, they give us a more flexibility. They allow us to do different things. It's performance. And there are all of these different aspects. It's not just the pricing. So I think if we get bogged down in the pricing, it actually does make things rather complicated. It complicates the argument rather than simplifies it. Yeah, but if you reach uh, an equilibrium of price, then the thing will, will t- th- there's a tipping point. I think we should compare with the, uh, the other fossil fuels that we should be comparing with that because we're in an energy market. And we need to start with the market and then say, right, from the market, this that gives customer requirements. And then we need to think about the reactor based on those requirements. Investment in the research to get us to that stage should actually take place outside the market. There's a real reason in, in any country for investing in fundamental research because you've got the possibility then, if that research leads to a product that the rest of the world wants to buy, which is much further down the line, you're actually developing an industry for that country. You're developing something that you can export. Well, if you're lucky. Um, if, you're, if you're lucky. If you're lucky there's, a, there's a limit to which market forces can achieve things. You've got to look at China, for example. Yes. Now, they've got plenty of coal but they've got serious pollution problems and and market forces will keep driving them down the the coal route. It's only the decision by government to look at nuclear power as a way of getting them out of this hole. In Western countries, um, I I don't think governments have that long-term view which allows you to invest in the research and in the technology development to to bring this kind of thorium reactor technology, whether it be ADS, whether it be molten salt, whether it be solid fuel, to realisation. Yes, we're looking at short-term gain. Unless that gain can be realised in the period of a parliament or a period of a government, it possibly is something that is not going to stir up much interest. Lose sight of the fact that it is a world-leading Western society because it did a lot of um, research and development in the past and has been a leader in in technology. And to sit back and say, uh, we don't need to do it anymore, uh, is is blind because uh, you'll find that the the developing countries will develop much better technologies than we ever developed and we will very, very rapidly fall behind. And in fact, here we are sitting in CERN and, and I know it's a cliche, but if CERN gave us nothing else other than the World Wide Web, the investment here would have probably been worthwhile. And that, that in a way, is government intervention. It's inve- in investment in the pure science, but the spin-offs from the pure science. Now, in this case, we're not really talking about pure science. We're talking about something which is much closer to the marketplace, but at a level in which a company like maybe EDF or Areva is not willing to invest because it is too far from the marketplace. And if it fails, I, I, th- I think if we take the case of, of, of Siemens, for example, in, in uh, you know, going back 20 or 30 years, they invested a tremendous amount of money in getting MRI up and running. Um, but, but the scale of the MRI is much smaller than the scale of a nuclear plant. You know, an MRI machine at the end of the day may cost a couple of million. A nuclear plant will cost a couple of billion. So you, you know, it's, a, it's a different scale. And I think that that's where you need the government. There's no real incentive for private industry to provide a country with an en- energy industry. They'll, they'll, they'll do what makes money, but the country needs an energy industry if you want to switch the lights on, if you want to keep warm. At the I, I would like people in research to be working much more on the question of cost uh, and to be putting that to them, say, you know, not how can we take it, how can we invent something and then how much does it cost, but if I gave you 200 million dollars, 2 million, million euros, whatever, what kind of nuclear reactor could you design for me? Well, and, you know, I, I think a design to cost approach. You know, as part of the, the, the technological outcome, you're also looking at the financial outcome as well. And I, I think that approach could work in some areas, but I think in most cases it hasn't worked. If you looked at the, the inv- initial investment in, in lasers or in um, silicon chip technology, a lot of that was done in laboratories and universities. It wasn't done in industry because industry didn't have the, you know, the vision to do that. But you can do a lot of that sort of research on the cheap and then you can hand it over to industry. But to hand it over, and usually hand it over for next to nothing, you need that government investment or the research council investment or or, um, some some benevolent agency giving the money for that that are not themselves going to directly benefit financially from their investment. What they're doing is they're stimulating the intellectual um, climate in order to deliver the technology. Companies can't do that. The UK's approach which says, 
we're happy for anybody to propose nuclear reactors, but we don't want to get involved. Is is just not going to just not going to work. It's not going to work. No, no. Do you guys want to try walking? Yep. You're not doing anything wrong. I'm just actually very cold. I I I think that there is a general discussion going on that nuclear as a whole is not taking off as much as it should because of the 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 the, the price cost, the, the the price of delivering it compared to fossil fuels. And the argument is that until the price of nuclear comes down to the price of fossil fuels, nobody will really adopt it on a, a wider scale. But I, I think that's, that's a, a false argument because there are so many other aspects of nuclear power generation, um, including CO2, or lack of CO2 generation, flexibility, sustainability, that um, would be in themselves enough reason to adopt a nuclear technology even if the cost was higher. And I, I suspect that if you take a country like, for example, the UK, which is said to be very aware of energy security, by energy security what we really mean is the cost of electricity, people are moving towards nuclear uh, generation as a way of protecting themselves against rising gas prices. I don't think I agree with you on that, but I think uh I think people are much more cost sensitive than than you think and in a world where um, the inflation is, is leveling off that there's very little growth in GDP in developing in developed countries um, I think that people cannot afford rising rapidly rising energy prices I think we could have uh, afford that in the 80s 90s and, and early 2000s um, because inflation was keeping pace. I don't think people can afford that anymore. And I think people are very, very price conscious about energy. So I don't think that saying there's going to be, you're going to get something else for it, is going to be a big enough argument. Well, I, 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 the, the, I mean, the way that I would approach that is that I, say, I would say that if we, if we continue to build nuclear plants one at a time, uh, and sporadically, yeah. that's intrinsically going to increase the cost, whether we do it with conventional nuclear or whether we do it with thorium or, or molten salt. Yeah. Doing things one at a time is in, invariably going to increase the cost. Yeah. We, we're building essentially a whole string of prototypes. If on the other hand sure. we go into the mass production, then initially there's a hike in the price, but ultimately there's a stabilisation yeah. and a lowering of that price. Mm -hmm. and and also with that, you've got the added advantages of reliability. Yes. Because you are producing, you're engineering it in right from the very beginning. Yeah. With accelerator driven systems, is there any opportunity for reliable through mass production of the accelerators? Like, can't you yeah, just yes, I, I, th I, think, I, think, I think all of the, at, at the moment, there well, are 15,000 <laughs> accelerators on the planet. Hang on, but yeah. before, you, before yeah. you can mass produce something, you first of all have to produce <laughs> one of them, <laughs> which is reliable. Yes. Once you've got one of them, which is reliable, can't, can't you then you can make others which are more reliable. And yeah. you can do that in a yes, way that's, that's that's engineered yeah. Yeah. I, you can't make one accelerator driven system which is reliable, you cannot copy it. Well, the, the, I, th I think the issue there is that naturally people don't design accelerators to break down. But the point is they, they don't design them for reliability to be the primary goal. The primary goal, for example, in the case of LHC that we have here, is the energy. Um, the primary goal of uh, the ESS mm -hmm. accelerator is to deliver the appropriate number of protons onto the target in the right bun shape. They want reliability, but it, that reliability doesn't have to be 100%. 95% is fine. And we can approach those 95% reliabilities. But each one of these accelerators is a prototype. Each one yeah. is built uniquely and it's designed for one, to a, a new specification and, and, and it's tweaked and it's touched and it's uh, optimised as time goes on. Whereas on the other hand, if we said what we really want is reliability as the major criteria, you would actually build an accelerator in a slightly different way. I mean, yeah, for example, as we are trying to do with the FFAGs. Okay, <laughs> but then it's a balance between customer requirements. So, you say I want more reliability, mm -hmm. you're going to get less of something else. Like power, for example. Or not, not necessarily, because um, I, I, to, you know, to, give, to give you just, just one example, you build most accelerators with a single injector. Uh, injectors are not terribly expensive. 
improve the reliability of an injector and use three of them and you've already mitigated against most of the trips that you would have. Fine. So the, the, now the, you're, you're increasing reliability because you've got three. But you've got three times the cost of accelerator. No, so, no, 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 because the, no, just, no, the injector is just... No, one. no, I said three injectors. Three injectors. Three injectors. Okay. I mean, this is the difference in going from a black and white television to a colour television. You know, you have three iron guns in the old cathode okay. gather ratio. So you, all, you all you're doing set. is... Yeah. But you have one set. Okay. Um, the, 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 other, the, other, the other issue is, is, is in the RF and a lot of the accelerator trips are due to unreliability in the RF. Start moaning if they took two of your yeah. pistons out of your car. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we'll give you a V8 engine but we'll only give you one piston. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I think that's okay as, as long as we don't make any noise once we get to the top. <laughs> I don't think anybody would be surprised having taken the two pistons out of your car yeah. that you found it a bit unreliable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's simply a different criteria at, at, in, in making accelerators for example for, for proton therapy yeah. now. Uh, they're, they're much lower energies, but they are much more reliable machines for, for radioisotope production. But we're also using accelerators constantly for irradiation purposes, for treatment of food, sterilisation, yeah. for even for packaging. Those accelerators are perfectly reliable because you're mass producing them. Okay. You've ironed out all of the quirks that you have in a prototype. Okay. It's not the same requirements, is it? You're not trying to produce quite massive amounts of power with those machines. Well, no, but, no, but the, the, intrinsically there's no difference. It's just the fact that you're making lots of them and you, you've made a turnkey system. You have train companies that build high-speed trains and ordinary trains and yeah. they still achieve. Yeah. The high-speed trains are still reliable like the slower train. Or Cessnas and yeah. Cessnas and, 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 uh, and, and jet airplanes. Why not we yeah. make some <coughs> low-powered in the same way you said, why not make some low-powered uh, Molten salt reactors. Why don't we? Well, I, I think that's the problem. Accelerators. Well, well, we do that already. Yeah, no, we do. Thanks, guys. Okay.